All right, guys, welcome back to The Historian's Craft. In this video, uh, as you can probably tell from the title, I'm going to be talking about Romanization and a little bit about how that actually happened and some of the resistance to the Romanization of various conquered and integrated or semi-integrated people in the Roman Empire. So, uh, before we do that, I just want to really emphasize the scale of all of this. So in the top left-hand corner of your screen, what you were looking at is a map of the Roman Empire. So there are, and I don't know if you can see it based on whatever screen you were watching this video through, uh, but there are a couple different shades of green on here. So they represent different extents, different boundaries of the Roman Empire, with the largest being uh, light green under Trajan. But my point is with showing you this map, this is a gigantic state. It covers probably a third of modern Europe, maybe. Certainly it covers a decent chunk of the Near East, it covers North Africa, the entire uh, Mediterranean basin. A lot of people lived here. The Roman Empire eventually absorbed a lot of different cultures. The various Celtic cultures, um, which, you know, Celtic is a linguistic group, I guess really more than anything else. Certainly the Celts living in Iberia, and the Celts living in Gaul, and the Celts living in the British Isles culturally had some similarities, but they were all unique, they were all different. Uh, Rome encounters Greece, they encounter Egypt, they encounter Persian culture. And so my point, again, is that there's a lot of people, all of whom have different ways of structuring their governments, their societies. So how do you go about ruling all of these people? And the key point I really, really want to stress with this here uh, is the following. So between... I don't know, 1870, 1875-ish, the Berlin Conference is in 1884 and 1885, so roughly that decade and up till like the end of World War II, uh, the world was in this period that historians call the era of new imperialism. It's this era when Europeans are constructing global empires, the French Empire, German, uh, Belgian, Dutch, British, etc. Japan gets involved here, so does my country, the US, so do the Italians. All of these countries build empires that try to enforce some degree, some level of uh, homogeneity on the colonial populations. Ancient empires sometimes did that. The Roman Empire is not one of these states, so yes. Across the entire extent of the Roman Empire, all aristocrats engaged in Roman culture and poor people as well. The, the common man engaged in Roman culture. But Rome did not necessarily go out of its way to really try and enforce one, uh, I'm trying to think of how to best describe this, one, I guess, model of Roman culture. One singular idea. You're Roman, you do this, 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 and this, not these things. It's not how we should view this empire. What we should understand the state to be, then, is a territory that engaged in versions. That's the key thing. In versions of Roman culture that were tailored to more local customs, more local norms. Um, and what that culture then looked like varied from place to place to place and from person to person. So there's a very rich uh, multicultural tradition in this state that gets paired with a monocultural crust at the very top. Not everybody was enthusiastic about this, not everybody liked it, but when we talk about Romanization, and being Roman, we should understand that, unless we're talking about the very end of the Roman Empire, because there's a slightly different situation which requires a different video. For most of Roman history, when you're talking about Romanization, being Roman, etc., uh, we have to recognize, we have to understand that this is Romanization by degrees, not necessarily one singular concrete thing. 
So, if there are different versions of Roman culture across the empire, then that begs the question, how did the Romans make this work, and what did it look like? So, the older way of looking at this, definitely um, from scholarship from the 1800s, and definitely from scholarship from like the early to mid-20th century, uh, is that this process of Romanizing the local populations was a top-down thing. You get the elites involved, and then they disseminate whatever it is you give them. Latin, maybe later on Christianity, uh, certain facets of elite culture, maybe it's religion, the list kind of goes on. It filters down through society. That's not really looked at as correct anymore because other sources give us a different reading, but we should understand that just because it's not necessarily a strictly top-down thing, that does not necessarily mean then it was strictly a bottom-up thing. Usually what happened, not always, but usually in the Roman Empire, is that when Rome moves into an area, the locals, so both the commoners and their elites and the aristocracy, realize at some point, once they're done fighting, that once Rome is here to stay, they have a lot to gain via Roman culture and uh, Roman integration. So what would they have to gain? Well, security, money, so definitely coins, but perhaps wealth in some other form like land. Um, maybe the Roman army is recruiting people, so there's a job for your son, let's just say. Many people received a Roman education, or a Greco-Roman education, which they could then, depending on the exact time period we're talking about with the Roman Empire, use it to kind of boost their family, increase their wealth, and move up socially. Maybe there are different ideas of slavery that get worked into the system. So there's a lot to gain from adopting Roman culture. But, again... These people take Roman culture and they adopt aspects and versions of it. Not a singular monolithic thing. And, on the flip side, the Romans do what the newly conquered peoples are doing. They take customs and ideas from across the empire and they integrate them into their own thing. So this is a constantly evolving uh, mishmash of different cultures, different ideas, all working together to ensure the Roman Empire functioned coherently as a state. So, what does this stuff look like? Well, we have a lot of records coming down to us um, of villages and towns, especially in southern Gaul. At least from my research, this appears to be the area where this really happened. But it occurs in some other areas across the Empire, like Britain. Um, there are numerous records of villages and towns kind of just picking up stakes, leaving, and the population of the town stays together, they're still like a, a, a unit, but instead of living here, they pick all the crap up and they move like 12, 15, 20, 25 miles over here. And they build a new city, a new town, a new village, whatever, that's designed and structured along Roman architectural patterns. So like grid streets, uh, Roman baths, etc. But some of the architecture is still local. There's still some uh, Gallic stuff that crops up in these new towns that are developed. So we see this in the archaeology. We have records of people doing this uh, in the texts. And, and additionally, in places where this wasn't done, there is still a heavy uh, influx of Roman culture in terms of architectural styles, in terms of new buildings that are constructed, like baths, Roman-style temples, the, the list is pretty much endless, uh, that crop up all across these integrated areas in the empire. Like, it, for example, if you go to Spain, there are plenty of old Spanish towns that go way back to this period, and they're tiny. These are like tiny towns. Not that many people live in them, and they have an aqueduct. They have Roman engineering bringing water into their towns, and it does two things. One, it helps integrate everybody into the Roman system, 
And the other is that it makes it very clear that Rome is here to stay. Empires quite often express themselves in architecture. Why? Because it's visible to everybody. It's fairly large, usually, and its impact is immediate. You see it. You see it being built. You see it going up. And then it doesn't go away. Additionally, uh, Roman power is attractive for the elites. So in Gaul, for example, and this is not the only place it happens, but in Gaul, for example, many Gallic aristocrats become Romanized because they realize that working with the Roman Empire as officials, as magistrates, and as an aristocracy more generally is useful to them because it secures their wealth, it secures their power, etc. This is why, at the end of the Western Roman Empire, when the Franks and other Germanic people start moving in, um, and the Roman Empire is no longer able to really exert a strong hold on Gaul, the aristocrats switch. They go over to the barbarians because that's just the new power center. But on the flip side, the Romans also do the same thing that their conquered peoples are doing. Roman elites, especially from Italy, um, notably the emperors, tried to integrate and co-opt and sometimes just outright steal other cultures and make them theirs because in Roman culture, things that were of a sufficient age um, and that were still around basically meant that it was a valuable institution, whatever it was, because it lasted so long. So for elite Romans, if it's old, it's good. This is part of the reason, and we'll talk about this in another video, this is part of the reason why, despite... Um, Jews in the Roman Empire being such an irritant for so many people because, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me, the Ten Commandments, the, all that stuff, which dictates that uh, Jews have a very specific way of understanding their religion. It's not necessarily that other gods don't exist, it's just that Yahweh is the chief god for the Jews and they can't worship anyone else. Well, then you can't do sacrifices to the imperial cult and all the other uh, elite stuff that helped secure Roman power. Despite the fact that, you know, for these reasons, they were irritants to the Romans, the Romans respected Judaism because it was old. This is part of the reason why Christianity is eventually taken on because it comes out of Judaism. But again, that's, that's another video. My point is that if it's old for the Romans, it's good. So when they go east, when they go to the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, they're encountering Egypt. So... Almost all of the Roman emperors in Egypt are presented as just pharaohs. This is how they're carved into the stone in art. They're painted in this manner. When Plutarch writes his, and it's up on a shelf, I don't know if you can see it, it's here somewhere. Uh, he writes this series called Lives, sometimes they're called uh, the Parallel Lives. We have 22 of these surviving. What he's doing is he's doing uh, a thing called comparative biography. And it's not just like, oh, well, here's this one person. Well, I think he's kind of similar to this guy. He has a very specific point in doing this because he's comparing a famous Roman up to a famous Greek. And the point is that, well, these two people are similar. They're kind of compatible. So the two cultures can do this. They're connected. It's a political thing. The Romans were very much interested in this. Uh, so going beyond that, when you go to Greece, you look at Greek archaeological sites from the Roman era, many Greek theaters show evidence of uh, some kind of a modification to basically make them gladiatorial arenas, which was an Italian custom, not Greek. Greek art and culture also impacts Rome relatively heavily. After Rome takes over Greece, you know, the, the standard quip you'll hear is that captive Greece captures her conqueror. The Romans fell in love with Greek culture. They adopt it into their own system because it's old. So it confers political and social and cultural uh, legitimacy on the Roman Empire. So again, I hope what you're seeing here is my point is that this is a system where various cultures mix together and support one another to ensure the entire thing functions. It's not like this monolithic imposition from above. But at the same time, not everybody was cool with this. Uh, there were plenty of rebellions that happened. Boudicca, for example, comes to mind in Britain in the year 
66, although I'd have to double check that. Somewhere around there, uh, Boudicca revolts in Britain. But also in more integrated areas like Greece, for example, this guy uh, named Pausanias wrote this series of guidebooks for Greece. And despite the fact that Greece is controlled by Rome, that guidebook ignores the Roman presence. He focuses on older things. Many Greeks welcomed the arrival of the Romans because it brought order to Greece. But at the same time, many Greeks looked down their noses at the Romans because you know, they're barbarians. They're not Greek. They try to be Greek, but not really. They fail at it. And not for nothing. In their view, who wouldn't want to be Greek? So there's a lot of uh, push and pull with all of this. And additionally, many Romans had issues with this, or appear to have issues with this. The most notable probably uh, is Tacitus, when he's talking about, you know, his father-in-law, uh, Agricola, in Britain. And he's talking about Agricola establishing, and we don't know if this is actually true, but he talks about him doing this anyway, uh, public education, building cities, etc., trying to Romanize the province. The British loved it, and Tacitus writes that, you know, they called it, in their ignorance, civilization, but really it's just part of their enslavement. So, eventually, though, towards the end of the Empire, this system, Rome, becomes the only model and lens through which people understand their world. Um, so, it's multicultural, but eventually it fuses together to such an extent that you just have Roman. And then towards the end of the empire, when things start breaking up, what happened, and Peter Brown goes into this in most of his book, as well as many other uh, scholars of late antiquity, when that solid edifice breaks, what you see is new growth of older cultures. So multiple languages come back out, older art forms surface again, the list goes on. My point with this, though, is that, and I'm going to close the video now because I kind of talked about everything I wanted to talk about, is that we should not conceive of the Roman Empire as the singular uh, monocultural unit. It, perhaps in some ways, becomes that briefly towards the end, but for much of its history, it was a multicultural establishment that wove together many strands from across the empire to create something new. So that's it for this video, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Take care, and I will see you all next time.